Hi everybody and welcome to this new webinar covering today brain mapping techniques in intraoperative monitoring. This presentation is intended for our distribution partners, employees and end users all interested in supplementing their skills on intraoperative monitoring. This is already the eighth webinar of the year. You can sign up and also retrieve all the recordings in our clinical website, www.natusneurologyacademy.com. Few words about me. My name is Anthony Milo. I joined Natus in 2011, part of the neurology branch in France to cover for EEG, EMG, and IOM products. Joined the international team as a CAPS in 2016 to focus on EMG and IOM modalities. What we want to cover today are three types of mapping, sensory mapping, motor mapping, and eloquent zone mapping. Let's start with sensory mapping. The sensory mapping test is also called and mostly known as face reversal technique. The goal of the face reversal is to localize the central sulcus that is the separation between the primary motor area and primary somatosensory area. Such a test is extremely interesting to rapidly uh, identify the primary motor cortex for tumor removal. This technique uses the reversal polarity of the N20 performed on an upper SSCP recorded on a supply placed across the sulcus. More details. The stimulation occurs, as we said, on an upper SSCP. So we will stimulate the median nerve on the contralateral wrist of the exposed cortex. From there, we will record the N20 or P20 marker on an eight contract strip that will be placed across the sulcus, so perpendicular to the sulcus. You can see a picture of the supplies that is, and that is used, and we can identify the eight contacts or four contacts um, sometimes on um, a silicone grid. These techniques requires involvement of the surgeon who will place the electrode and sometimes also we need to reposition the strip if we cannot properly record the, um, the signals. Fulling is a picture of the technique. On the top left side of the screen, you can see the placement of the electrodes for the median stimulation. The cathode should be placed on the wrist and the anode around 2-3 cm distally of the cathode. The grid is placed on the exposed cortex perpendicular to the sulcus and if the grid is properly placed we can see on the right side of the screen the recording and we can see the N20 marker that will at some point change polarity. The contacts between the two where this reversal happens shows the central sulcus. Then we will measure the N20 amplitude or P20 amplitude and that's really where we have the highest amplitude difference that we can see the phase reversal. On this screenshot you can also see on the right side that on, on some systems we can have a help to actually see this phase reversal in a more efficient way. The redder the color, the higher the amplitude difference between the contacts. The N20 amplitude is quite large because we are recording directly from the cortex. It can be between 20 and 500 microvolts. If you cannot see the polarity reversal, on the eight contacts, then what you will need to do is to reposition the strip and perform this test again. In terms of parameters, 
the phase reversal technique uses the same stimulation parameters than SSCPs. So what we will use is an intensity of 1.5 times the moment we can see twitching of the APB muscle. The stimulation rate is around 3 Hz. Guidelines always provide numbers between um, 2 and 8 Hz and also say that sometimes fine adjustments might be needed uh, to eliminate environmental noise. We are still recording an SSCP here. The stimulation um, duration should be 0 0.2 milliseconds. In terms of recordings, the signals will be recorded in a band pass between 30 Hz and 1 kHz. And we will need to average the response, but not so many times. For standard SSCPs, we need to average around 250 times. This time, it, you, we can get quite a good response between 25 and 50 average response. To make sure that we have properly identified the sulcus, we need to have at least two trials where we see this phase reversal between the same contents. In terms of readings, the montage can be differ differential or referential. Differential means that we will read contact 1 versus 2, 2 versus 3, and so on. Referential, we will read each contact compared to a, re a reference that will be placed on FZ or on the contralateral mastoid. The recordings will look quite different if we use differential or referential uh, montage, which we can see in the following slide. We can see here uh, two recordings of two different patients. On the recording A, we are using a referential montage and we can easily see the phase reversal between the contacts 2 and 3. Here we have a pretty clear reversal. On the right side of the, of the screen, where we have the B recording, we can see on the top part of the screen a referential mo montage and on the bottom part a differential montage. The bipolar montage will show a better defined phase reversal, but in terms of identifications, it will point towards the post-central region. So the choice of montage really depends on who will interpret the data. For information, the points, the two contact points where we have the highest amplitude change mark the um, area of the hand on the sensory and motor cortices. In terms of accessories, we use as a ground a plate electrode or band electrode. The idea is to maximize the surface of the ground. However, in challenging environments, a subdermal needle can be considered. It is crucial to never use the same ground as the coterie. In terms of recording electrodes, a, a grid of eight electrodes will be used and placed directly on the cortex. And for stimulation, we will use the same supplies than for the SSCPs. Therefore, we can either use um, subdermal needle electrodes, twisted pair will be the best option to minimize noise in the recordings, or also cup electrodes. Of course, the stimulation electrodes, the subdermal needle, will be secured with tape to avoid en any involuntary removal. Moving on to motor mapping. Motor mapping will be performed after the sensory mapping once we started resecting. The idea here is to preserve the motor functions while we resect and also maximize the removal of pathological lesion. This test in the philosophy resembles MEP's testing. 
we will directly stimulate on the brain, this time directly on the cortex, on the resection site, with a stimulation probe or a strip, and record muscle responses from the limbs and face, or look at clinical signs, signs which means muscle twitching. For stimulation, two stimulation techniques exist that we will detail later. The multiple strain technique and also the pen fill method that are used with a probe. The probe can be a monopolar or bipolar probe. When we use a bipolar probe, the active and the reference are already in the, um, in the probe. However, if we use a monopolar probe, we will need a reference needle to be placed, for example, in the temporal region. Then we start stimulating the patient at 1 milliampere, and we increase the stimulation up to 20 milliampere. In the US, the maximum amount in the, um, in the um, guidelines are 15 milliampere, and we will get a warning if we record any muscle response, physiological response or muscle response. We need to be aware that motor mapping can be performed under general anesthesia or also in the weight patient. And the mapping threshold depends on the type of surgery that we have. In general anesthesia, the threshold will be roughly two times the threshold in a weight craniotomy. So start stimulating at a low intensity, up to 25 milliamp, and we have a warning um, a motor site if we get a muscle response before reaching the maximum intensity. For the recording, we will record the muscle activity induced in the contralateral limbs and face. The recording bandpass will be between 20 and 1.5 kilohertz. And there, two schools exist. If we don't need to be muscle specific in the recordings, we can insert one needle per muscle only and then create channels that will monitor two muscles at the same time. It is nice to reduce the number of needles needed in the patient. However, this can induce more artifacts in the recordings. On the other hand, if we want to be muscle specific in our recordings, then we will insert two needles per muscle, separated by roughly three centimeters, and this will also populate less artifacts in the recording. I mentioned that we have two stimulation techniques that exist, the multiple strain technique and the pen fill method. Let me describe here the two different techniques. The multiple strain technique is mostly used with a monopolar probe. And this is a repetition twice a second of a train of five pulses, which settings you can see on the drawing. The pen fill method, on the other hand, is used with a bipolar probe, and it is a 60 Hertz stimulation that can last up to 10 seconds. The multiple strain technique will enable you to record muscle response because you have a silent period that is over 50 milliseconds, which will allow you to record physiological responses from your limbs. It is also known for having less epileptogenic effect on patients. The pen fill method is a stimulation, a 60, a 60 hertz stimulation with a total duration up to 10 seconds, where we will actually monitor the muscles through the eyes, looking if we have some muscle twitching. It is an alternative to the multiple strain technique and depends on the surgeon operating. In terms of recording, the recordings are extremely similar to 
MEP recordings. So we'll, we will see the here using the multiple strain technique, the stimulation artifact on the left side of the recording. And after that, see a polyphasic response that corresponds to muscle response from the limbs. Those responses, they will show around 20 milliseconds for the upper limbs and 40 milliseconds for the lower limbs. As soon as we get those polyphasic potentials, then we are sure that we are on a motor site. We can see here a second example with a recording where the neurophysiologist inserted one needle per muscle. And we can still record some good signals, however, not muscle specific. The last mapping that we want to cover is the eloquent mapping. In this case, we have something quite similar to motor mapping, and we want to preserve the language function while we are resecting a tumor and also maximize the removal of pathological lesions. In eloquent mapping, we will once again directly stimulate the cortex with a stimulation probe or a strip, and then we will record clinical signs. There is no physiological recording available for such tests. In eloquent mapping, we use a bipolar probe using the Penfield method. This requires the patient to be awake and will be then only be performed in a way craniotomy. Just like in the motor mapping, we will start the stimulation at 1 milliamp, but in this case, we'll go up to 15 milliamps only. The recordings, as mentioned earlier, are mostly and actually purely clinical signs. What we want to detect is language disorders induced by the stimulation. There is a portfolio of exercises that we can perform on the patient to um, detect any language disorder. We can present pictures and words to the patient and ask him to name them. We can ask him to count. We can ask him to repeat phrases. Right before we start this, we start this stimulation that will last up to 10 seconds and see if we have any disruption of speech. For each stimulation site, we will need to repeat the test at least three times. And the site will be a positive site for language if we have speech disorder a minimum two thirds of the times of stimulation. As I mentioned before, in this case, for eloquent mapping, only the Penfield method can be used. The multiple strain technique has too much silence period to properly monitor the language, and therefore we only rely on the Penfield method. The Penfield method does have more epileptogenic um, potentials, so therefore we need to be cautious of certain aspects. We have a large variability of threshold between the patients. If the intensity of stimulation is too high, the stimulation might spread to the primary cortex. It can also induce um, epileptic discharges. In some cases, um, people like to monitor ECOG, which is electrocorticography, to monitor after discharges. ECOG is simply an EEG recorded directly from the brain, from the grids. If we see after discharges on the EEG, this is a sign that the stimulation has spread beyond the electric tips and also can be a sign of a risk of seizure. Monitoring ECOG is a nice way to help keeping the stimulation intensity below false activation so that we are sure 
that we are properly stimulating the eloquent zone. At the same time, because there is an epileptogenic potential, we need to have ice cold saline ready to stop any seizure. In terms of accessories for the stimulation, we will use probe or grid, bipolar probe or monopolar probe, depending on multiple strain technique or pen field method. For recordings, we will use subdermal twisting needles in the muscles or surface electrode in an awake patient. I just want to have a short note on the probes. We regularly have the questions about what is the difference between the monopolar and the bipolar probe. The bipolar probe will differ from the monopolar probe because it has the active and the reference both um, very, uh, at a very short distance from each other. The stimulus is then focused between those two stimulating poles. This is the most widely used probe for the pen film method. On the other hand, the monopolar probe will have a wider stimulation because the stimulation intensity reduces less with the distance compared to a bipolar probe. And this is the better option for motor mapping with the multiple strain technique. Finally, what I want to cover with you is anesthesia. Some anesthetic agents have an effect on face reversal, brain mapping, and ECOG during procedures. So I just want to provide you a short cheat sheet to help you monitor your patient and ensuring the quality of your recordings during the procedures. The first agent that we need to talk about are volatile engines, agents. On phase reversal, they cause amplitude reduction and latency delays. So we will have a delayed N20 or reduced N20. We need to avoid the use of volatile agents for phase reversal. Same idea with the, with the muscle recording. We need to avoid this on brain mapping. In ECOG, it will distort the waveforms in a dose-dependent manner. There are some papers that properly detail the effect on EEG depending on the dose that the anesthesiologist can have. So we can use volatile agents on ECOG as long as we know how they will distort the recordings. Neuromuscular blocking agents will need to be avoided if we are doing a brain mapping with muscle recordings. For face reversal and for e ECOG, they will have no effect. And even on ECOG, they can be quite useful because they will remove muscle artifacts. Propofol, who is um, in um, MEP quite the go-to method, can be used for brain mapping, can be used for face reversal. However, if we decide to perform ECOG, the use of propofol should be discontinued 20 minutes before we start ECOG recordings. Else, the quality of the ECOG cannot be ensured. Finally, narcotics can be used for face reversal and brain mapping, but they can have an effect on the seizure threshold on ECOG. Papers mention that um, alphentanilin um, must be avoided when performing ECOG. Prefer pre preferably, the go-to method for the anesthesia when doing face reversal, brain mapping, and ECOG should be Tiva, and we should avoid bolus at any time. This is it for an overview of mapping techniques in IOM. You will be able to download all the literature 
and register for upcoming events on our clinical website. If you have any specific questions, do not hesitate to contact me on the email displayed in this slide. And now I will open the chat for your questions and I will then try to answer them directly now. Thank you very much for your attention.